Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the virtual seminar series organized by the NUS Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions. Thanks for joining us today uh, for our final session of the year. Uh, my name is Dan Fries. I'm the deputy director at the center and your host and moderator for today's seminar. So before we begin, just like to remind everyone uh, to kind of keep your microphones muted. And please note, as you just heard, that this session is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube later. Okay, so uh, today we have with us Jackie Hocking, uh, the founding partner and CEO of Vision Strategy Storytelling. Jackie has captured stories around the world as a documentary filmmaker with the UN Global Climate Expedition. And she is now a serial systems entrepreneur building B Corp certified companies that work with multinational clients and visionary social enterprises around the world on their strategy and storytelling. Jackie is also the co-founder of the Singapore Eco Film Festival and Forbes 30 Under 30. So Jackie's talk today will explore the use of strategic storytelling to capture your audience's attention, raise emotional awareness and inspire behavioral change. Considering the evolving digital communication landscape, citizen science and collaborating across diverse ecosystems as tools for communication. This topic is really relevant given the urgent need to communicate effectively on climate issues. Uh, so we'll have a presentation. There will be a question and answer segment in the last 20 minutes of the seminar. And without further ado, Jackie, please take it away. Thank you so much, Dan. And hi, everybody. Hope you're all having an amazing time. Let me just share my slides with you. So before we begin, I'll just give you like a little bit of a quick introduction from me. At any point, if you guys want to get in touch or if you have further questions, feel free to tag me or send me a message on any of the channels on the internet. My handle is there, so feel free to get in touch. So I don't know if you guys do this, but I have this spreadsheet that my other half built for me, which is like a, a geeky version of how many days you have to live. Right, and I like to kick off every workshop and presentation with this because it's a good reminder to make sure that the time we spend, like moments like this are so crucial because we all have limited time on this world. And I think out of everything that's happened this year, um, this event is so important to me. Communicating about climate change is probably one of the most important things for all of us right now. So I'm really, really grateful to be spending my time here with you guys today. So quick background, as Dan kind of mentioned, um, I have a crazy background. I actually spent many years living on this boat with these small little humans uh, trying to communicate around climate change. And what began as a kind of warning message around the world, it ended up we seeing so many inspiring solutions that we were actually sharing and scaling solutions around the world. So that project led me to be basically become a storyteller for social environmental issues for a bunch of different things. Um, and one of the things I learned from Tanzania to Nepal to Panama was that there are so many solutions out there that already exist, right? So then I feel like there's all of these problems. There's, uh, you know, from plastic pollution to all of the issues with climate change. But the solutions exist already. Okay, so that, that's what's hopeful and that's what's really exciting. Um, just a reminder to keep on mute. We're not on mute. <laughs> Maybe Dan, you can go and mute them. Yeah. Um, awesome. So, yeah, so the solutions exist already. So then what do we do? If we already have the answers, then all that's left is to scale them around the world. So that's been my focus for the past kind of 10 years of my career is trying to find visionary solutions and scaling them. And the best way I know how to do that is through storytelling. So I've done a bunch of different companies and a bunch of different projects, celebrating solutions for the film festival or working with multinational companies because they are the fastest way. They're the biggest way to share and scale ideas. So that's like a quick introduction about me. Some of you might have met me already um, at the Singapore Eco Film Festival, which is a fun project that we've run here in Singapore. Um, but anyway, on to the presentation. So today we really want to capture, if you forget everything today, there's three kind of things that I really want all of you guys to learn, which is, first of all, connect into an ecosystem bigger than yourself. Find like-minded partners. It's so important when you're trying to tell a story. Uh, the second one is try and make something really, really inspiring so that once you've found your people, you're sharing with them constantly. 
And the last thing I want to think about is like how you can then empower your audience. So if you forget everything, just screenshot this slide. You can log off now and go and have your breakfast, but at least please try and remember this. It's so important. Okay, so let's start with that first pillar, which is connect, right? I mentioned that it's good to connect with, you know, other people, but it's also really important to connect with yourself and tell a story which you really feel inspired by. Um, I wanted to kick this off with something that I thought was very resonated with me quite a lot, which was quite a funny way to tell stories. I'll just play the video for you. Here, I, I've got an experiment for you. Safety glasses on. By the end of this century, if emissions keep rising, the average temperature on Earth could go up another four to eight degrees. What I'm saying is the planet's on <laughs> fire. There are a lot of things we could do to put it out. Are any of them free? No, of course not. Nothing's free, you idiots. Grow the you're not children anymore. I didn't mind explaining photosynthesis to you when you were 12, but you're adults now, and this is an actual crisis. God, here, I, I've got an So one of the reasons that that went so viral and it resonated with so many people as a storyteller, um, a lot of people in the US remember Bill Nye from childhood. And then, so it's this familiar, relatable character, and he's speaking in a language that everyone can understand. And it was so direct. So I think that that's something that's, I think, really powerful. So it's like people will forget key messages. They'll forget your data. They'll forget your statistics. But they're never going to forget how they feel when they hear your story, when they, when they learn about what you're doing. So I think that's ultimately the fundamental truth of all storytelling is like, how do you make people feel something through your stories? So let's kick that off. Um, there's two things I want to do. Now, I, I learned this concept recently in another uh, Zoom webinar, which I thought was really fun, which is called a waterfall. So everybody in the room, I want you to use the chat function and I want you to type what you need from the session today, but don't press enter yet. We're going to press enter all at the same time. So I can see what everyone wants to do when we see it, but just pick one word. So what is like one word for something that you need right now? Is it ideas? Is it hope? Is it connections? Is it friends? Uh, is it inspiration? Is it motivation, energy? Um, so everyone type your word and on the count of three, we're all going to hit enter. Okay. So has everyone typed up their word in the chat room? Dan, have you got your word ready? <laughs> awesome. Okay. One, two, three. Wow. So fun. Ideas, perspectives, positivity, inspiration, practice, knowledge. I mean, just think about the power of this call right now. We have probably almost 100 people that are listening and probably even more on YouTube that are all sharing. We all share this same need for whether it's knowledge, whether it's community, whether it's hope. So hopefully this session, if nothing else, can, can connect some of you guys so you can collaborate. So for those of you that are watching on YouTube, I'm afraid you'll miss out. But for those of you live today, we're going to jump into a very, very quick breakout room. You'll be partnered with one other person or two other people in the audience right now. And I want you to share how you feel about climate change right now. Um, you could quickly mention maybe, uh, you know, the research you're working on or something you're doing, but just share one or two sentences about how you feel. Okay, so breakout room is ready to go. Hosts. <laughs> I think we're all slowly getting back into the room. I hope you guys managed to connect. Um, with your fellow participants, if you manage to learn something new and share a bit about how you're feeling right now. Um, I think it's, we don't remind ourselves enough about how we feel about the topics that we're facing. And climate change is a pretty heavy topic. So it's good to share about it with other people and, and make, find like-minded friends. So is everyone back in the room? Boop. That a, yeah. yeah, cool, I will continue. Okay, cool. So yeah, so once you know about how you feel about climate change, this is something really important because storytelling is all about feeling, right? But obviously it's not just for yourself. What you wanna do is make other people feel something, right? So storytelling essentially is evoking others to feel something. So here's a quick little cheat sheet. I'm not gonna go into details, but write down like what is your vision what is the world that you want to see right and then after that how are you going to get there what is it that you want people to do to make that happen okay then you can figure out okay well if i'm really successful what does that look like do you need millions of people to hear your story do you just need like 
one or two people that are really important to hear your story. So getting really clear about why you're communicating and why you're telling a story is like the basic step, right? And then once you've drafted that out, think about it. How does it genuinely make you feel? Are you really excited seeing this on paper? Are you like, okay, this just feels like homework or boring? So try that exercise a few times just to get really clear about why you're doing what you're doing. And then this is a bit of a cheat sheet that I really love that I use with lots of different things, which is once you're really clear about that kind of anchor, that vision, that mission of why you're doing this and kind of what you want people to feel, you might need to adapt your story for different audiences, right? Maybe you need to inspire your other colleagues or your other researchers or other people on your team, right? How can you use that vision to keep them engaged? But then on the complete other side, how do you get like the general public? Maybe you want young people in Nairobi to get really excited about it. So be really specific about who it is that you're trying to reach. And then you can use this framework of like, okay, well, these are the people I'm trying to talk to. What is the objective I'm trying to get there? What's the call to action? Once they've seen or absorbed my story, what do I want them to do, right? Um, how are you gonna measure it? Is it views? Is it, maybe it's not even views. Maybe it's people that actually commit to come on and join your program, right? So mapping this out as basic as it is, you'll be surprised how many people don't do this when they think about communications. Um, the other thing that people forget is that everything is dynamic, right? So maybe there's a journey for all of your audiences. There's the young people that don't know about climate change yet, or they're beginning to understand, or now they're really engaged, or maybe they were engaged and they've fallen off your radar and you need to re-engage them. So just get keeping in mind, use this as a bit of a cheat sheet to think about your audience and where they're at. Okay, so the whole thing that I'm really excited about is you guys should probably be familiar with this. If you're not, I'll be very surprised. Um, but there's a reason that this went so viral, right? The ice bucket challenge was super strategic with how it mapped out the ecosystem and how it targeted people to ensure that it went viral, right? And that I think is one of the magics for storytelling, okay? So there are so many movements and ecosystems out there right now that are working on climate change that you can be a part of to leverage your story, right? One of my favorite one is this 500 women scientists, which I recently discovered during this whole process, where these groups of scientists, these women are coming together and collaborating to try and get their voices louder. And then similarly, She Changes Climate is a group of really powerful women that are basically saying there's not enough women representatives in these conversations that are happening in the global stage. So I'm sure there are other communities and groups that are already out there in Singapore. And I think some of you might even be in the audience. There's an amazing kind of nonprofit organization called Climate Conversations. So before you start telling your own story, map out your ecosystem. Now, the problem is it's hard because there might be lots and lots of different things. So what I suggest is weight the priority based off three different things, okay? So the first thing is alignment. Who are the people that are that share exactly the same vision. Like you're doing the same thing. You guys just need to combine efforts. So that's a really important one, okay? The second one might be reach. Oh, well, these guys already have like 10 million followers, right? So I wanna kind of piggyback off their reach. So that's obviously also a good priority. And the last one, they might not have any followers, but maybe the president of the country is the one that you wanna retweet your article because he's super powerful. So mapping out your like, ecosystem, figuring out, okay, who are all the different people that will share my story? Maybe you've written an amazing article and you're about to share it. Well, you shouldn't be the one sharing it. You should tap into your ecosystem and get these guys to share it, right? So that's like a nice little cheat sheet. To give you an example, um, this is a mobile phone company. Uh, it's the woman that used to make chocolate. Now, what does chocolate and phones have in common? Well, chocolate used to be one of the largest slave trades in the world. A lot of chocolate, a lot of cocoa have slavery in the supply chain. And Tony Chocoloni was the first chocolate to abolish slavery. And they were like, hmm, what about my phone? My phone has lots of slaves within the supply chain. So now the fair phone is trying to become a slave-free phone, okay? And instead of just doing traditional marketing or traditional storytelling, look how great our phone is, they, they focus on building communities. And that's what makes it so amazing. So you can start your own community, you can, join developers about how to make this phone even better. You can make your own hardware on the phone to make it more circular economy. That's the kind of storytelling of scientists that I think is really powerful. Um, 
ultimately you want your kind of audience to become your ambassadors. So you do less work and they do the work for you, right? They're the ones sharing and telling your stories. And this is another great brand you guys can research later. Okay, so let's just say you've got this amazing insight. You've got this incredible research that you've done on climate change. Um, you've mapped out your ecosystem and, and you know, okay, this is who I'm targeting. This is what I want to achieve. Then there comes the actual storytelling, right? Sharing your story. Number one, I said it before, I'll say it again. You need to be empathetic, right? You have empathy. That is what will evoke action in other people, okay? Um, the reason, like I said before, that Bill Nye one is so funny. It's like, it's very relatable. Um, you guys would have remembered this little gif up in the top right corner. I can't see you, but I hope some of you are smiling. Um, when you remember that little girl, like interrupting her dad, giving a very important speech. The reason that went viral is that everyone felt that. <laughs> like we were all universally embarrassed at that same moment for him slash it was hilarious. And so I think this kind of storytelling, which is really human, very authentic, um, is really, really powerful. So how can we use that for climate change? So it's not just like videos that you go and tell a story. There are other ways you can actually immerse people in the experience through storytelling. And Nat Geo recently did this really well they actually made an interactive experience with augmented reality, which was what will the world feel like in 2070? So it really puts the audience inside that perspective, which is a great app that you can play through Instagram. Another one, this is probably one of the most powerful that I've seen, but unfortunately didn't experience for myself. Um, Studio Ruzga did this incredible uh, art piece using light and smoke, which basically puts the city underwater. So it really, you're immersed in this amazing art piece to communicate you know, what the world could look like. Um, another quick example, Clouds Over Sidra was a storytelling where you become a refugee of Syria. And so we can start thinking about these storytelling ways. It's like, how can we evoke empathy to really understand our audience, right? There are so many ways to do that. Um, you, know, you can be giving a talk, um, you can build a community, um, you could run a festival like we did in Singapore. You could create a game, augmented reality, events, videos, articles. The platform itself doesn't matter, right? As long as you're building that community and you're inspiring and evoking empathy in the audience. Okay, because that emotional like belonging is where we're going to get collective action when people feel a part of it. So there's a few different ways. Um, for example, the types of storytelling, maybe you want them to feel relief, you know, like a little bit of like, oh my God, someone who finally understands me. I think that's why I like Bill Nye so much. It's like, oh my God, the frustration. And it's just so funny. And it's just like, yes, it's like this, this humor relief, right? Um, another one might be like raring, like urgent and like angry, right? Um, you know, you've got this, uh, you know, Greta, like, oh my God, like we need to do something now. Like that's one way of telling stories. Um, I'm probably more on the lines of like David Attenborough's recent film, which was really like a witness statement, which wasn't quite glaringly angry, but it was still pretty assertive in his messaging, right? Um, but for me personally, and maybe what I, what I would like to share with you guys today is the most powerful way that's worked in my experience is actually taking these massive problems and showing hope and invoking inspiration, right? And there's actually a reason that I think that, you know, envisioning to inspire, there's a reason why I think this works better or is the most effective way to communicate climate change. Okay. So negativity is actually a disabler to action. We have this like bias towards negative news, right? So we feel negative things more than we feel happy things. If the front page is like, oh, climate change is great. Then everyone, it's like, oh, okay. Like, <laughs> it's over. <laughs> we need to like feel optimism and inspiration. And that's kind of where I'm hoping that I can inspire you guys. So my little cheat sheet of how to do this, um, you can't just say that we're all going to be fine, right? Because if you say that no one's going to believe you, you need to build credibility. So first of all, you have to be honest. We're in a little bit of a pickle. Okay. <laughs> so you have to be as honest as possible. You know, the planet is burning, right? Get that out there up front. Um, you know, if you've done something wrong, the best way you get out there and you say what's wrong, right? In climate communications for corporates, I'm always telling them like, you have to be able to be honest and, and say that, look, we caused this huge problem, okay? But then you move into the next stage. You caused it, but now you're hopeful for how you're gonna fix it. And this is really important for scientists as well. 
you have to be hopeful that, look, there are many amazing solutions. Technology is advancing faster than we ever could have imagined, right? So yes, honestly, it's a little bit terrible. I, I have to bleep myself out, um, but I'm so hopeful for the future. But the most important thing is you cannot stop there. The next step is you need to help them. You need to invite the audience into your story to go and take action, okay? So um, making it relatable. I really like Elon Musk's way of like, it's really unforgettable, right? We're going to Mars. I mean, how like the story is so inspiring and so clear, it's understandable. It's very uplifting. Like there's hope we are going to become this like multi-planetary species, right? Um, and it's very urgent that we need to transition to new types of energy. And I think that's one of the things that Tesla has been so successful. Okay. Um, I just want to quickly jump into this. Once you've got this like amazing story and you're like, okay, I know what my story is. I know how to evoke action. Um, because I'm a documentary, I come from a video background. A lot of people are like, okay, but how do I make video, right? Because the internet is mostly video, especially now in 2020. Okay. Uh, how do you do that? I love this little gift, just a moment to appreciate a dog floating mindlessly in space to symbolize how lost people are with how to tell stories. Um, the first question is normally, oh, but you know, what camera do I use? If I need to do video, I need to know what camera to use. And to be honest, it's just the one in your hand. Like whatever you have, it doesn't matter. The technology, the camera, whether you have the best camera, whether you have your phone, whether you have your laptop, like making video is not hard. It's just about trying to find something which can turn you know, this visual into a video that you can then go and create. What's important is the storytelling. And when you tell an amazing story in the lowest quality camera, that's still just as powerful, okay? And in terms of software, you say, oh, I, I have a camera, but I wouldn't know how to edit it. There's software out there which is so cheap and so simple to use. We video even has educational tools where students and stuff can even learn how to edit movies right and this is there's no difference in editing on we video than editing on these really expensive professional platforms um so definitely try once you know your story just have a go at trying to create your own video or if you don't want to do any editing loom is a way that you can just screen record like i'm talking to you right now and sharing with your team so there's lots of different platforms out there to create video um and in terms of where you're going to post it i love this example like if you look at LinkedIn, right, there's billions of people posting on LinkedIn all of the time, but then there's like millions of users all around the world. So it's like a good place to target, but there's only like a few million that are actually posting every week, which means that if you commit to sharing your story every week, you can actually become like one of the top, you know, 1% people on these kinds of platforms. So whenever people say, oh, but it's too hard to make video, or it's too hard to get my voice heard. I always argue with them. It's like, yeah, okay, it's not easy, but it is possible. You just need to create these simple frameworks and tools to make it better, okay? And then once you've captured people on social media, let's say on LinkedIn, then you bring them over and you engage them on your platform, whether it's your research or your website, then you can actually become partners and find people because you're in your storytelling, you told them to come and get involved and then they become the ones telling your story. And then it amplifies and it gets bigger and you grow this huge ecosystem. So it's not you constantly telling your story, you're creating this loop and engagement of communities. Okay, so last part that I think is really important. We talked about you know, connecting, mapping out your ecosystem, building up your community, and then telling a really inspiring story that's helpful and hopeful. The last piece, which I hope that you guys know more about this than me, is empowerment, right? Creating tools that they can use, okay? So this is the helpful part, okay? So for example, you don't want to tell a story about people that are affected by climate change. You want a story with people affected by climate change and use those tools. So citizen science, I think, is an amazing example. Um, one of my favorite stories, you might have heard of Precious Plastics. It's a guy that basically built this incredible tool to recycle plastic. Now, the storytelling for that is everyone is creating their own stories and everyone is creating their own designs. And there's this map of the world where you can plug and play and see where people are building their own machines, these little like maker spaces. Um, and this is the kind of thing that imagine if we could do that with climate change. Okay, so I see change is an example of that. So they're actually encouraging people to make this like library like, okay, what do you see in your backyard? How is it affecting you? And you're getting that data. So not only are you improving your research and you're learning more, but 
through that process, you're creating this story, this beautiful like global story that we're co-creating together. Um, another example of that is Ground Truth, which is a very, very similar model where it's like bringing people in to get engaged and amplifying that voice from around the world, okay? Um, the geekier you get, the more tools there are, like I'm a huge fan of data visualizations because it's a very powerful way to tell a story. Um, so if you haven't used it, um, D3JS is a JavaScript way to take all of your data and visualize it into something beautiful, whether it's a map or here we have a visualization of how all of the global goals are all interconnected, um, which I think is really beautiful. Um, and the fun ways to share data, like here you can see a data visualization the Guardian did of what Shanghai will look like in climate change underwater, right? And how, how severely that's gonna be impacted using data. Um, this is not climate change, but I thought it was fun how the New York Times let everyone submit their own story of cycling in New York. So it was like this cycling community, this we're able to go and co-create and share their story and build an audience there. Um, and data doesn't have to be complicated. And I think that's really important to remember is that we sometimes get so into the data and the facts and the figures with climate change because we see what's happening and we're urgently trying to get people's attention. Like, but look at these numbers, like it's so obvious. But for other people, they don't understand the numbers. They're not familiar with using numbers and graphs. Even if it looks clear to you, you have to speak in a language that other people will understand. And um, this was a great video. It's actually really old. That has like 7 million views. I think he's a high school teacher just clearly stating that, okay, well, let's look at our options with climate change. We take action, we don't take action. Okay, the worst case scenario is we spend money fixing the problem, right? And we've lost a bit of money. But if we don't do it, we're gonna have this global catastrophe. And it was so obvious and simple for anyone to understand and no one could really argue with it. Okay, I know I'm running close out of time. I'll nail it. I just want to like brain dump you with some amazing ideas. Um, the climate collage is a great tool that you guys can use and download. So if you Google that, um, you can get a series of playing cards to share different ideas to have, um, to talk about climate change as a way to make it more interactive. And then I want to share a video. I think this is probably one of my favorite storytelling tools talking about climate change. So I'll give you a break to actually watch this so you can absorb it. But I just thought it was such a clever campaign. Andrew. Sandy. Ivan. Katrina. Since 1954, the World Meteorological Organization has been naming hurricanes and tropical storms. But what did these people do to deserve having their names attached to this? As climate change continues to create more frequent and devastating storms, we propose a new naming system. One that names extreme storms after policymakers who deny climate change. We propose something like this. Senator Marco Rubio is expected to pound the eastern seaboard sometime early tonight. Windows are being boarded up and grocery stores are virtually empty as Marco Rubio threatens everything in his path. Now, Michelle Bachman is on the way, folks, and specifically the eye of Michelle Bachman will be hitting Florida in a few hours. Congresswoman Michelle Bachman is incredibly dangerous. If you value your life, please seek shelter from Michelle Bachman. <laughs> Senator David Bitter is turning out to be one of the hugest and costliest disasters in American history. So it's like a really fun, uh, engaging way to tell a story that was very unique. It taps onto people, it got people's attention, and it's a very different way to communicate, um, you know, what is a more traditional way of telling the stories, right? So Anyway, I know that you guys will have lots of questions that you want to ask. Um, what I'm going to do is I've compiled a whole bunch of homework. <laughs> so if any of you want to watch um, some more series, where is it? Some more links or listen to more talks or dive deeper into this topic. I'm super passionate about it. I could talk about this for days. Um, and there's lots of other people around the world. And I think we're starting to see a convergence of storytellers that are really passionate about making an impact. And at the same time, you have scientists that have been desperately trying to get their, their message heard. Now we're starting to see this convergence of where storytelling and scientists are coming together and forming partnerships to be able to use the power of storytelling to really make a difference because we've seen what storytelling and the control of media can do on the other side of you know, making these problems worse. 
we need to be smarter about working together to really solve some of these challenges. So here's a whole bunch of resources. We'll share the links with you. Um, and if you have any more questions, like I said, please connect to me. I'm more than happy to share more ideas and collaborate with you. So yeah, I think, I think I'm done. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jackie. That was really inspirational and, and full of information and thoughts. And I think everybody in the audience is going to be able to take away something uh, from their own, uh, yeah, their own research and how they can communicate it. Thanks so much. Um, okay, so thanks for that. Uh, we're now opening the floor for questions, and you can submit your questions via pollev.com forward slash cncs. And through that platform, you can also upvote other questions that you find interesting as well. Um, so the link should be in the chat box. Okay. Um, so the first question we have is this question here. Um, how do we snuff out or tackle greenwashing in communications? I think that we're seeing it more and more right because consumers are demanding change right employees don't want to work for companies if they're not social and environmental so the the demand for climate solutions has never been higher so suddenly everyone has no choice but to adapt and say that they're protecting the planet and they have to kind of greenwash as quickly as possible or their entire staff is going to quit <laughs> no one's going to join the company and no one's going to buy their products so you're seeing this influx of greenwashing or people stating good or bad what I would say is that um, don't be judgmental of people trying to change, right? Like try to help them. If a company says that they want to change the world, help them do it. Because maybe what's happening is their greenwashing is their stepping stone to be able to enact a, enact a difference, right? Now, of course, it's a balance. You don't want to be able to falsely support an organization that at the back door is doing terrible things. So the way that I talk about it is that does their impact directly impact their core product? And that's what's critical. So I don't take seriously any company that, you know, oh, but we're building schools over here or we're donating to education over here. But meanwhile, the mine on that side of the river and it's like, what the hell? You cannot consolidate these two things. Their core product has to be purpose driven. So that means it's not a brand. It's not a campaign. It's not an ad it's their actual product that they're manufacturing. Are the materials circular economy? Is the raw material regenerative? Does it have slaves within the supply chain? You can look through the entire value chain of a product from the raw material to the producing. Maybe the product itself is crappy, but their factories are all solar powered and low water usage. So think about a product in a full circle. You have the raw material, you have the production, then you have the use of the product. Does the use of the product generate you know, CO2 emissions, for example. And then lastly, after it's been used, what happens to it? Is there a good circular model where it can then be reused and turned back into raw material? So I think that there are ways that you should definitely make sure that, and, and push companies to make sure their core product is what's changing. Because anyone who says that they're doing great things while they're also selling fossil fuels is probably gonna be a big red, 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 red flag from my side. But don't judge a company for trying to change. It's kind of like, telling someone that they're, if they're not, if they're only vegetarian and they're not vegan, they're not good enough. It just doesn't help the world move forward. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, okay. Um, the top question so far is, how do we ensure that storytelling is equitable? And how do we get other and minority stories to go viral as well? This is one of the most important topics where it's not necessarily your story, right? What your role as a storyteller, and I would say controversially, I would argue that every scientist's responsibility and job right now is to become a storyteller. Because if you understand information, your job is now to make sure that people understand it too. So every educator has to be a storyteller, right? To engage children, to inspire them. So uh, putting that there, <laughs> then looking at it is like, your job is to empower others, right? You need to inspire others. So giving them a voice. I come from a place of privilege being white, but that for like, can I use my privilege to be able to share the voices of others that don't come from that background? For example, um, I think that every time that you go to tell a story, see if instead of it's your voice coming out, can you actually lift those around you? And 
Um, there's another really great storytelling example in Australia, and uh, the name escapes me right now, but they actually were working with Indigenous youth where the Indigenous youth were telling their story. And the, what they were doing was just creating a platform for kids to be able to amplify and share their story and create that community. So I think it's really important that you create platforms, you build communities, rather than you're pushing out a single message. Cool, thank you. Um, okay, next is, how do we, let's highlight this one here. How do we combat the increased spread of misinformation around science communication? It's why I'm here today, to be totally honest, right? Like, I'm not getting paid right now. I could go work for an advertising agency and sell shoes if I wanted to, but like, you know, I look at that, how many days I have left on my life. And I think, no, the most important thing I could be doing in my life right now is talking to all of you right now and giving you the power to tell stories more effectively because we need better storytellers in this space. We combat it by being better. <laughs> like, there's misinformation out there because they are better storytellers. Like someone in the political realm got elected because that someone was a better storyteller. They understood the audience. They were empathetic. They, they put words out that the people wanted to hear. That's the storytelling that works. And we know that. The problem is, is the people that are telling a different story don't have those tools yet and they don't understand that. So when we become better storytellers, we're able to combat fake news. We're able to um, you know, find an equal voice. I think we just need to become better storytellers because even when people know something is fake, it, if it relates to them, if it gives them a sense of belonging, they feel safe, they, they understand that. Why would they change to feel that discomfort of something unknown? So we need to create stories that invite people in, that give them that sense of belonging, that make them feel a part of it so they can join a movement that's inclusive, right? And more and more we're, we're getting this divide of two different worlds and we need to be, be come together. We need to tell stories that make people feel safe and belong and can get involved. Thanks, yeah, that issue of discomfort, I think it is really um, important, thanks. Um, let's look at this question has been upvoted a few times. How has storytelling resulted in actual behavioral change, such as recycling more or using less electricity? Well, I just used a, ne a negative example, right? Like I just say like a behavioral change. I mean, I think that the impact of that storytelling machine was phenomenal. I mean, it literally caused an entire, you know, shift of, of culture in a specific country that I won't name, but, um, in terms of positive use, I think that we're seeing it right now in plastic. And I would say that that really sparked from David Attenborough um, on his series, Planet Earth, I believe. Um, and where there was a scene that of, um, you know, of these animals being impacted by plastic waste, right? And when people see that they really felt something, <laughs> right? They, they included that in their story very intentionally for people to feel that feel that sense of empathy. Oh my God, this is what, what's happening. How could we do this? And I think that has triggered over the last four to five years, this huge groundswell of movement towards plastic waste, looking at things like the circular economy, right? And, and now there's, um, you know, most of my, my day job is working with, you know, these companies like deploying investments into plastic solutions to promote, you know, better waste management, better recycling, um, circular compostable products, right? So I think that um, storytelling is the result of that, right? Someone planted a seed, told an amazing story, and then someone else has joined in, and now there's this whole movement of zero waste. On Instagram, I follow about 20 Singaporeans that are like zero waste influencers. It's so cool. These kids are like maybe 16, 17 years old, and they've got huge followers because zero waste is this really cool trend. So I'd say, yeah, the best example I would say would be storytelling. I don't want to quote this example specifically, but I would say that the, um, the plastic bag movement in Singapore also started off as storytelling, right? They were trying to promote this idea that we don't need plastic bags in Singapore. And I think that's really what changed government policy. Up two degrees, another one in Singapore. Um, Sandra was a woman that pushed out this story that, uh, um, that in Antarctica, like she used, she walked around in the penguin suits and she was basically saying that uh, to be able to cool down the planet, we need to push up two degrees our air conditioners in Singapore. And just that small shift actually pushed all the way again through to policy change at government and through to green mark buildings. So I think, yeah, storytelling, um, all of the positive impact you see in the world has normally sparked from stories somewhere. 
Uh, thanks for all those, especially the examples uh, from here. That's really great. Thanks. Yeah, up two degrees was a great campaign. Okay, let's take a look at this one. How do we tell stories that talk about climate change on a structural level, uh, as most stories tend to be focused on individual action? So I'm not 100% sure I understand what you mean by the word structural. So whoever asked that question, if you want to unmute yourself and share or elaborate, um, I, if that's possible. If it's not possible, I'll give it a crack. <laughs> Oh, okay, I'll, let me give it a go. So structural change, like I, I'll answer it from the second half. Many stories tend to be focused on individual action. So I hope that through the last, you know, half hour of that presentation, you now understand why actually it's that collective action that tells the most inspiring stories, right? When you feel that sense of belonging, when a story has inspired you to feel something and it's evoked action to feel this belonging with a community and, and grown a movement, right? That's what's most powerful. So yes, Many stories are not told well in climate change. Many scientists don't understand storytelling. They are talking about things like the results, the impact, the data, the graphs, um, you know, that it, it, which is obvious, like, well, obviously this tells a story of negative and positive, but they don't understand that storytelling is about feeling. And what do people feel when they see graphs? Not a lot. <laughs> what do people feel when they see that they are part of this movement of community of people that love each other, and support each other, and they're working towards a mission? Like you feel excited, right? So I think that um, I sorry I can ramble and talk about this for days, but I just feel like yeah, one of the things is we definitely need to stop being individual in everything we do, not just storytelling, and start to think of ourselves as an interconnected ecosystem. Um, I call it planetary leadership, right? We need planetary leadership where we think about our leadership and our voice as part of this planet and no longer about you know, nations and everything and like we need to be much more in it. that's going way down the rabbit hole <laughs> i hope i answered your question that was a fascinating rabbit hole thank you um okay this is a, a great question any communication or storytelling hacks for introverts a hundred percent you will never ever ever believe me but I swear I'm actually more of an introvert than an extrovert. So I'm a well-trained extrovert due to the importance of my role as a storyteller. Um, and I would say that one of the storytelling, like you're behind the camera, right? So you don't have to be in front. <laughs> so maybe that's the other excuse. So if you're an introvert, um, hopefully my presentation was really useful for you because it basically told you that all you have to do is create a spreadsheet of all of the other people that have a really loud voice and then get your story and get them to share it. So actually, if you're an introvert, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be on the front page of a magazine. It does just mean that you have to be strategic in how you get your story out there. Now, having said that, I will give one little uh, disclaimer, or, or let me contradict myself and say that I hope I can also inspire you to, as an introvert myself, to step out your comfort zone and get out there especially for different people from, you know, we talked about diversity in minority groups, we are lacking in voices. And people are using the excuse of in, being an introvert or being shy or not having confidence to not get their voice heard. So I wanna really challenge you to say, you have a responsibility. The world is on fire. <laughs> Be an adult, get your voice out there. We all have to step up. And yes, it's horrible. I remember the first time I gave a, a TED talk, probably similar to this conversation. I was throwing up before, I was throwing up after, and I was a complete mess, but I made myself do it and, and again and again and do that exposure therapy. Because I think, um, yes, you might be an introvert, but what's more important? Right. And uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll say it on both sides is there's ways to do it. Be gentle on yourself. Your mental health take comes first. But at the same time, get out there and make sure your voice is heard because your your voice specifically is important. Right. Thanks. Really inspirational. Thank you. Um, we still have a few minutes for questions. So please keep the questions coming. Um, OK, just seeing that one. Okay, let's take a look at this one. Uh, who would you say are the voices of climate change victims in Singapore and whose story should we be trying to tell? I think that everyone in Singapore is in a very privileged place. Right? We're in a very privileged place because we're working within a government that is really working towards it and, and acknowledges it 
and is designing cities with that future in mind. So we are beyond privileged, right? We are so lucky to be in a country where they are, you know, from the urban planning to sea level rise, like I think that we're really, really lucky. So it's, um, I think when I think about climate change victims, it's not the first country that comes to mind. What I would say is that it's an interesting or controversial thought is that how can we then support our nation to become more powerful? And thinking about victims, like I wonder if there's a way that we could actually help and work with the public sector and with the government to help implement some of these solutions, right? I think that um, it's really, really hard to work in the public sector. It's really, really hard to work in government. And there's a lot of people working there that really want to make change on climate change. And so, I mean, it's a bit bold to say that they're a victim of climate change, but I think it would be really, really interesting to think about the public sector more and offer more support as scientists, as storytellers, as how can we actually help you know, um, public servants to do, to do their job better, which is you know, basically this public service, right? So I think that's a really interesting angle when I think of Singapore. Um, in terms of minority populations in Singapore, I think it's, there's a lot of countries across the region that are gonna be severely, severely impacted and Singapore will be at the middle of that. So we have a responsibility, although you know, our little bubble is in a way shielded from a lot of the most severe impact, um, that it's not because anything that happens in this region impacts Singapore. So it is our responsibility to protect and, and support and imagine how many people like migrant workers like myself um, that live here, you know, like there are so many issues happening around our region to these home countries, right? For different people, like the sea level rise in Bangladesh is gonna be quite dramatic. Like how do we support the region to then support Singapore? So I would say that yes, any kind of, any migrant population in Singapore, including myself, like um, will be impacted because the world is changing. And uh, yeah, so specific minorities and, and then the gender, um, the general minorities of Singapore, I think we just need to get their voices told because there's already prejudice there. So we need to fix those also in the context of climate change. Thank you, thanks. Okay. This is fun, Dan, I could just sit here all day. I, I know, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm conscious of time ticking, but, um, but there's so many great questions still coming up. and. Uh, Please, everyone, you can upvote uh, particular questions as well if you uh, are interested to do so. Okay, let's take a, a look at this one. Uh, so Singapore government does care, but policies are not exactly IPCC aligned. So do storytellers have a role to be alternative voices uh, that help Singapore to really push the bar? There is always a role for alternative and diverse perspectives. There is always a role. So it's not in this case, everyone has a role to give their diverse opinion. That's why I'm kind of joking about introverts. Your voice matters because we need everyone's perspective out there. The most important thing for you, if you have a perspective which is not well known or you don't think people are talking about it, that's why ecosystem is important. You need to make your voice louder, as loud as possible to combat different voices. And, and we've seen this globally happen with gender, right? Like the voice of, of different genders was louder than others. And so by coming together now, the voice at equilibrium is, is raising them bar. So I think that the, in, in the second part of the question, absolutely storytellers have a role to create alternative voices and they need to find partnerships to then make that voice louder. Um, and then talking about Singapore not being IPCC aligned, I think that I, I truly believe that, again, I feel like we're in a very lucky place and that if we align our voices in a way which allow to make sense, I think we're in a place where that the state per se will listen, right? We're working collaboratively with people. And I think that that's, people listen to loud voices. So if you think that your opinion is very important, use that priority, whether it's partnering with powerful people, um, whether it's powerful with huge reach with millions of reach, um, or whether it's just people that share exactly the same vision so they have that same passion, like use that kind of, that cheat sheet to find people to get your voice equally heard, to push your, you know, your agenda and to share your agenda. The other thing which I find absolutely phenomenal, um, you know, being someone that wasn't born in Singapore, that is a very famously, you know, want, wannabe Singaporean that I would love to have my citizenship of Singapore. Um, a lot of my conversations with my Singaporean friends state, um, you know, that there's, there's a bit of a disconnect between, you know, or, or, but it's not accessible. 
And I would again push that um, from the experience or from the privilege of not being born here and seeing an external perspective or third party view, it is the most accessible government that I've ever, ever seen anywhere in the world, right? There are avenues there. Is, I've been in, you know, round table discussions, open dialogues, collaborative platforms, um, websites, social media, you know, I mean, these kinds of things might seem obvious if you're born here and that's all you're exposed to, but that is just unheard of in other countries. So I think that um, always keep in mind that if you don't like something or if you have questions about someone or why are they not aligned, like ask. There are so many open doors for you to get involved and engage. And that's that difference of like, you're wrong, you're right. It's that like, you're wrong. Oh, let me think about how can I evoke empathy? Let's have that conversation. Let's belong together because that shared vision is the same. And that's what's really important. You know, uh, the government might want the exact same things as you, you have different approaches to get there. So let's align on what we both want. You know, we both want prosperity. We both want to protect people. We both want the climate to stop warming. Let's come together and find a way. So yeah, again, long winded answer to your question, but I would definitely say that you have a role a hundred and thousand percent. Awesome, thanks. I'm just conscious of the time. We've got so many great, um... We've got so many great questions and not enough time. This will be the last question, unfortunately, but uh, this one has been voted uh, a few times. So let's sure. take a look. And for anyone, if I didn't get to answer your question, like I said, feel free to stalk me on any of the internets and um, I'll try to answer all of the questions I can, whether it's on Twitter or whatever. Great, thanks. Okay, so the final question. Uh, social media is primarily used for entertainment and leisure. So what is your perspective or stance of sharing and engaging others about climate change science on these platforms where they can just scroll uh, the, the content away? So firstly, I would argue is that, is that just because your experience is using social media for pleasure? <laughs> because there are thousands of people that are using social media as a tool to build businesses, scale companies, connect with ecosystems, organize. Um, social media is not just a tool for leisure. Social media is an incredibly powerful tool for building networks and collaborations. Now, whether it is statistically primarily used for entertainment, sure, probably a lot of people are using it for entertainment. But there is definitely a way that, what is it, engage others? I mean, climate change. I think that there is no reason why your content should not be entertaining. There, there's a quote, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was something saying that um, if you separate entertainment and education, you know nothing about either <laughs> because and education is nothing but entertainment and entertainment is education, right? Those two things are one in the same. So if you're saying that social media is just used for entertainment, well, that is education. You educate people through your entertainment, right? Like all of the kids TV shows that teach you how to count that's that's education. It's just like you might think it's entertainment when you're three, but actually your mom and dad just wants you to learn how to count. Right. And it's exactly the same when you're an adult, whether it's a video that they want you to buy something. Right. You know, Red Bull videos are super inspiring, but ultimately they're, they're product videos. Um, social media, there's always an intent behind it. So you can use the same power and those same tools to get your message across. But I would uh, sorry, really good segue. And maybe I didn't clarify this enough that first documentary that I was doing, like traveling around for five years, talking about climate change, the story itself wasn't talking about graphs and data and, and measure. We were talking about sailing around the world, cycling to the highest mountains, going from school to school and, and, climb, and collecting trash along the way. I mean, the story was the adventure. Um, my first company in 2010 was about using adventure and excitement as a way to engage people in the story. So, Yes, if that wasn't emphasized enough already, make your story entertainment. Make sure that it's engaging, make sure that it's inspiring and that it's funny, it's comedy, right? Your stories should be entertainment first to be able to educate and all education should be entertaining. So I hope that that clarifies the difference between the two is that, yeah, you, all, all storytelling ultimately is fun and entertaining. Thanks so much. I, I'm really sad that's all the time we've got. Um, I mean, thanks for all of your answers and your presentation. You're so relentlessly optimistic and inspirational. So thanks uh, so much. And I'm sure everybody is taking away certainly what I'm taking away from it. Uh, so thanks uh, for taking the time to share your work. And thanks, everyone, uh, for your active participation and questions. Uh, so please, uh, please.
said, please uh, feel free to reach out to her if you didn't manage to answer your question uh, during this session.